Hey everybody, I'm Dane Peterson. I'm a voice actor out of the Dallas, Texas area, and you are watching the Keith Andrew Network. I was just interviewed by Keith, and this is a fantastic show, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Thank you. The whole point of my talk show is to show you that even if I have an awareness disability, I can style them out to something. And at the same time, I'm able to turn myself into an example for people out there dealing with any types of learning disabilities and disabilities to never give up and prove people wrong. Prove to them that labels do not dictate who you are and who you're going to be, so prove them to style them out to something. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Keith Andrew, and welcome to the Keith Andrew Network. This is episode 1074. That is right, 1074 interviews with the one and only Keith Andrew Network, the talk show host with a disability. Now, with that being said, you heard just heard from our guests who just did a recommendation. So with that being said, let's get started. Question I, I want to ask you, very first question I want to ask you is the coronavirus. As of this, <laughs> we might as well start it big, right? With everything yeah, right that had, with everything that's been happening for three years, has this given you a different outlook on life? Uh, I think so. I think so. Um, but I've always been kind of a careful person in terms of hygiene and that sort of thing. Probably made me more hyper aware i would say um and probably more hyper aware in terms of when i'm in pretty crowded situations um but yeah it's it's wow well, it, it, it i think like like you like everybody else it's it's definitely changed things no i agree with you yeah. usually, usually when i talk about it and we have special effects on the screen so for certain subjects you get to see them not right now obviously but when you're watching it on youtube uh right you know for me i used to work over at walmart and i left uh, but it was crazy over there people stacking up on white salt you know stacking up on tall papers you know everyone made a joke oh the storm's coming tall paper and emodiums tall paper and emodiums yeah um, but in a way because we're in the entertainment world it's kind of like, okay, well, sit back, relax, drink a cup of tea. I don't have one in me, but vitamin water. <laughs> you're going to drink some there vitamin you water, and you get to do what you want. You get to do auditions. You get to do um, interviews. Um, you know, it's pretty much... Well, let me ask you like this. A lot of people made a joke saying, I wish I could work from home and never leave it. Well, thanks to the pandemic... We got that, and now people don't want to go back to work, and that's a problem. But, yeah, you oh, know, well, in terms of what I do as being a voice actor, and I'm, I know you've interviewed a lot of other voice actors, it's, it's had a huge effect on this business, um, negatively in some ways, but I think positively in a lot of ways, and in my journey of being a voice actor i think it's had a lot of good effects um just in terms of when i wanted to really get into this and pursue it as a serious career path and how i've connected with other voice actors it really uh it i don't think i would have been here without the pandemic happening it's kind of a weird thing to say but it really is kind of true well i used to say uh, a lot of people criticize me for this but i i used to say the pandemic was a, a blessing and a curse the blessing is sure. you know you have your health you get to do what you want the curse is unfortunately people died in process but for people in the entertainment world you know it's kind of like would you agree or disagree that Doing self additions is now the new normal. Doing voiceover additions, you don't have to leave your house. You have your own studio. You can send it in. Versus about 10 years ago or 20 years ago, now I'm dating myself, where you had to get up and you had to travel. 
I mean, it's nice to travel, but do you think it's easier now versus then? Ah, uh, trying to think, because I mean, I'm I'm older too, so I, you know, I also can kind of go back and remember travel pre nine eleven. Yeah. So we've seen these different waves of things happening. I mean, you know, travel changed a lot since 9-11, but I think travel, travel changed with COVID, but it's all, things have kind of gone back to pre-COVID. And part of that is with, you know, you see like the FAA relaxed their, their restrictions. So, but I, I think there are plenty of people that are still very careful when they travel in terms of on a plane, because Let's face it, you are in a uh, a metal Petri dish when you're on a plane. Yeah, you're so, pretty much. You, <laughs> you know, so you, you can still make that choice of like, you know, do I mask up on the plane or not? Do I take that chance? And if I'm in other, you know, maybe heavily crowded situations, how am I going to treat this? So. No, I agree. And uh, my brother and my sister were saying, you know, for, you don't have to wear a mask all year round. But certain times of the year, like going into the fall and the winter, flu season, or you have a cold, that is definite. It makes sense to wear a mask. But if you're outdoors, you know, it's, I mean, yeah, yeah, you're outdoors, but it cuts down the risk. But if you're in a crowded place and it's that time of year, you know, you don't have to wear a mask if you don't want to. I'm fully vaccinated, right. so um, worst I can get is a cold or whatever. But you go, you mentioned uh, 9/11. My biggest problem is the security should have been any time where you're at an airport and you have that many people. Security is your number one priority. You didn't need yeah. a natural tragedy to be like you know a smack in the head and what for a freaking a wake up call. That should have been all along. i give you an example, and you probably know this. Um, last time I, well, you yeah, actually don't know this story. <laughs> uh, my parents went on a big um, airplane to go to the Bahamas. And you know, they did on security, you know, whatever, the people behind them, oh, you have a knife, that's okay. You have this, okay, that's okay. Now, knowing the fact that people have knives in their pocket should have been a red flag. But now after September 11, you know, they tackle you to the floor and likely they should, because that's what normal people should. But it's kind of relaxed. Oh, you have a knife, that's fine. I'm going to get steak on a plane. I need something to wrap it up. But it's, you know what I mean? From stupidity of, okay, what's the worst? Okay, blah, blah, blah. To tragedy, to now you're like, guns fired if that makes any sense yeah you know i i definitely remember when 9 11 happened they uh i live in the dallas area and i remember they were interviewing people at the at dfw airport and a woman was there from germany and she was just you know she was flabbergasted she was like i don't understand why this country went so long without serious security measures in place she's like this has been the norm over in Europe, especially in Germany. You know, she was stunned that something like this happened so easily. That's the scary part is, you know, in this day and age, thanks to the uh, lessons of the internet, through cyber warfare, you know, all you need is some smuck, press a button, and you know, that's pretty much it. But not to talk about politics or anything, but uh, right. <laughs> here on the key fans in our freedom of speech, self-expression. And I like, you know, be interactive. Now, it's not the same 15 questions I ask over and over. It's kind of like, okay, you know, be human, be real, be spontaneous. But the next question sure. I want to ask you is what attracted you to begin your career as an actor? Well, I think I probably have a similar answer to a lot of people as a kid. I watched a lot of cartoons, either on my own or with my parents. And I learned pretty early on that there were people that that portrayed these characters. And of course, the first one that a lot of us, I think, learned 
uh, was Mel Blanc, um, famous voice actor for Warner Brothers and others. And then I learned that he didn't just do the Warner Brothers characters. I learned, oh, hey, he's he, he does that Barney Rubble guy. Or, oh, he's he also does Mr. Spacely on the Jetsons. <clears throat> so I realized that this was something that people did and not and for various animated features just like oh uh the uh, american top 40 guy does robin on super friends and also does shaggy you know you start learning that that's a thing and then i and then i went to i realized that it became people who did this for films whether whether they were animated films or later on with say uh science fiction movies or whatever that um, creatures and characters um, had voices to them or you know and um, so it was always something in the back of my mind that I think I wanted to do I acted as a kid I was in plays and things like that so I was always interested in the craft of acting but never tried to pursue it for the longest time as a career um, I went on to go to school and get degrees in music and become a professional musician which I kind of still do to, to a degree today. But I had friends, this was probably, this was a few years pre-pandemic, but I had friends who were also musicians that started getting into voice acting and doing commercial voiceover. And so that intrigued me. And I looked into it and I talked to some of those friends and um, they started sort of giving me advice as to how to maybe put a demo together and maybe what to expect in the business, but nothing too thorough. But I went ahead anyway and worked with a friend and um, got a demo made. And then I had another friend who was already doing it as well. And she moved here with her husband from New York. And I used to do websites as well. So I helped build her website. And as I was looking through the content, I thought, oh, well, she's done a lot of voiceover for various commercials and videos, narration. Oh, what's this? Audiobooks. Okay, this looks interesting. So I looked into that as well. And this was around 2018 or so that I was exploring audiobook narration as a, maybe as a career path. So I asked her about it and she pointed me to the site called ACX, which is uh, run by Amazon. And it's, uh, it stands for Audiobook Creation Exchange. And it's a place where you present yourself as a producer or, or, or also authors go to uh, get their books presented in digital form and where they're looking for narrators to help produce the project. So I signed on, developed a profile, started doing auditions and about three auditions in I finally got my first book and did that and now many books later I'm I'm still doing it but I've branched a little bit outside of uh, ACX and I've started working with like some independent publishing houses to get projects as okay. well tell us a little bit about your books so I've done a wide variety of books that the first book I did was kind of a young adult book and it's called uh, it's it's a, a series called Masterminds Incorporated and it's about these kids that are about 12 years old and they they, they live in a, a a town in in New England outside of Boston and they're kind of uh, it, when when uh, the main protagonist Jesse Beamish lived in Boston, he started this organization and then he moved to a smaller town and met new friends and then some paranormal things started happening in town. So he kind of revived Masterminds Incorporated, recruited his friends and then it became, you know, a new venture in his detective agency. So uh, I've, I've narrated two out of the three books. The second book was told from more of the female protagonist's point of view. So uh, a female narrator was hired, which was, I think that's how the best, that was the best way to do it. I don't think I could have uh, pulled off narrating a book that way. Um, 
And then I've done other books ranging from spiritual, like Buddhist related books, um, or just kind of self help kind of related books. I've done books where it was uh, kind of property owning business related, but the majority of books that I've done lately have been very character driven, which is what I love to do because it allows me to narrate the book and also be a wide variety of characters in these stories. And a lot of them are very, very wide ranging and colorful characters. So the past few books I've done have been kind of uh, murder mystery or just kind of mystery in general. And uh, they've been a lot of fun to do. No, absolutely. Don't mind me. Uh, so, my shirt's now like wrinkly. I was looking at my reflection while you were talking, and like, I, I, <laughs> I think I need a time for a new shirt. But you mentioned uh, the website. You know, who pointed it out to you, and would you recommend it to, to anyone? Like, did he get any? Not to sound like an ass or anything. Did he get anything out on the website or? You're speaking about ACX? Yes. I did, and it's a, it's a fairly well-known uh, hub for um, auditioning for audiobooks and, and finding authors and that sort of thing. A lot of narrators use it. I think a lot of narrators also, they wind up connecting, you know, they, they sort of um, market and, and network with other publishers or some get signed to bigger named publishers to doing this. But ACX is a good place, I think, to start if you're a pretty new narrator. Um, I know there are other services out there to try and and get work and be an audiobook narrator, but ACX is pretty well known. Um, I think it's helped. I think it's helped um, me connect with authors. And like I said, I've started working with independent publishers now the work still goes through acx because acx is a is a good place to start and have it kind of generate the contract that you'll have for the book and make sure that payment is taken care of properly and um you know acx does require the author to not only record but fully produce the audiobook so you have to kind of get savvy on um mixing, mastering, making sure that it meets all their requirements for proper sound levels and uh, anything else that goes into the production of the book. So um, if you've never done it before, I mean, I don't want to discourage anybody and say, don't go there, but um, with any aspect of voice acting, if you're doing audiobook narration or even what we call the verticals in voiceover, that just means the different types of voiceover, be it animation, video games, uh, uh, radio imaging, audiobook narration, you name it, promo, etc. cetera. Uh, it's best to really get with a coach or take classes or both. So I would say, while ACX has been helpful, I would recommend to anybody, and I learned this kind of the hard way too, um, I did not start with a coach and I did not start taking classes. So I've been kind of almost backtracking and, you know, with several books under my belt and also working with studios to narrate videos and trying to audition for a whole bunch of things. I, I it was about a year and a half to two years ago, I kind of put on the brakes and said, okay, I need to refocus how I'm doing this and I need to get proper training and I need to get I need to go down the right avenues to really make, if I'm going to make this a viable career. And the question I want to ask you is, what's hard about catering and building to the right audience? Because you're in voiceovers and you have done a lot of different voices. So how hard is it catering to the right people and audience? It can be difficult. I, I, I'm trying to think of how best to answer that question. Um, because when you're hired, you're hired kind of by the client and, and you're just the person who's sort of interpreting 
this script and uh, or or the book or etc. Um, I don't know. Can you elaborate maybe on, on on what you mean by finding the right audience? I mean, like for an example, your books. Like when you write the books, do you have an audience that you have already made up in your mind? Like this is who it's got to be directed at. But and the same thing with your voiceovers. You know, do you want it to be catered to the kids, to adults, or make cater to adults but kids like it? And if you like you're doing it for the kids, adults like it. Because in, in every audience, especially me, it, for my talk show, build it and cater to the right audience. I have so ma many different varieties, varieties on the show: wrestling, actors, producers. So I try to cater to everyone. But as a voiceover, is it the same thing as in I have to cater to this group of people or that? Well, I think when you speak about that. That would really relate more to maybe if I'm promoting myself as a voice actor and maybe also trying to do content creation. When it comes to what I would voice, that's not necessarily up to me um, because I'm hired to be that voice. And so it's the client that really is responsible for who they're reaching. You know, when I when I narrate an audiobook, I haven't written the book. The author has, and they're trying to find a voice for this um, format of the book. Uh, so say, you know, I've done a wide variety of things, but I think those audiences, hopefully, if the author is already connected with them, that it's, they've already in a way found their audience. Now I think writing a book, having it in print form, and then maybe doing it as an audio book would hopefully expand your audience, you know, but. I think in terms of the genre I'm narrating for, or if I'm doing something like a video game or an animated feature or something, that is really more related to say the studio and their audience. You're just embodying that character. Does that make yeah. sense? Yes. Now what's the last was five, sorry, tongue tied. What's the last five minutes left? There's two things I want to ask you real fast, but so I just do want to bring the subject up really quick, if I may. Social media, can social media make you or break you? And what's your favorite website that really helped you in your career? Good question. Um, if you use it right, it can make you. Um, now, I think I primarily use TikTok and Instagram for my voiceover uh, my voice acting career and probably TikTok more so than Instagram. And I never wanted to be on TikTok in the first place, but then I realized as some of that content trickled through Instagram and I was seeing things that were more related to voice acting, like voice acting challenges and duets that people would do. But then occasionally things would trickle in where it was a voice actor talking about their experience and also giving advice led me to finally join TikTok, and it's been incredible as far as the people that I have connected with and learned from and um, yeah, I think it's, it's and I really try to use it primarily for my voice acting journey. I try not to use it for anything else personal or getting into maybe social issues or political issues or that sort of thing. I think if you if you just try to market yourself and, and sell yourself as, you know, for, for me, for example, as a voice actor, then um, stick with that and I think you can probably do well. It does come down to maybe how often you're posting and what you're talking about and maybe if it's often entertaining and positive and something new all the time and maybe, you know, for me as a voice actor, um, you know, we, I have been hearing from other people that some voice actors don't always post voice actor things. They try to show other things that show to people, here's what else I do in life. And I think that comes down to each individual. It comes down to whether or not maybe more of your personal life you want to show off. 
So that that's an individual choice. Um, but I think it's been helpful so far. And I, I'm, as I've said, I don't post a lot. Um, maybe I will step that up as time goes by, but I'm also working on my career as a voice actor, trying to get representation from an agency or trying to expand the types of voiceover I want to get into as well as the uh, frequency of my auditions in order to get work. As far as a website that I think has really helped me, uh, I would say off the top of my head, they are called Voice Masters. And they are based in LA and they actually started during COVID to bring this full circle back to COVID. Um, they took advantage of the fact that we were locked down, we're doing Zoom calls or whatever else was being used. The amount of home studios skyrocketed with voice actors. So they took advantage of that to start teaching uh, young, old, inexperienced, experienced voice actors. And it started with just teaching animation, but they have expanded to teaching commercial voiceover, audiobook narration, the business of voice acting, video games, even a class on singing for animation, because that's a completely uh, other thing to explore. If you look at any Disney movie, Pixar movie, that's kind of more of a musical, it really helps if you're a voice actor being a character, but also if singing is involved, you are still that voice doing it. So, yeah, I agree. I think so they are, um, I, I have uh, taken classes with them. I have done a lot of uh, clubhouse sessions with them. And uh, I just, uh, this past summer, I finished two demos. I did an animation demo and a video game demo with them that I'm extraordinarily proud of. My animation demo was just nominated for an award. Uh, it, was, it was nominated um, back in September or October. And so, um, I've been very happy with them and I will continue uh, taking classes from them. I've become good friends with them. So they've been really just extraordinarily supportive. And uh, I would highly recommend anybody who wants to start taking classes in voiceover to, to look into Voice Masters. No, absolutely. And the last thing I want to talk to you wrapping up, when I first approached you to be a guest on my talk show, what made you say yes? How do you feel now? And what do you recommend it to other people? What made me say yes was you sent me a link and I didn't just watch that link. I went back to um, some other episodes that you did and there were people that I knew, whether personally or not, that you've interviewed before. And so um, I thought, well, this could be a great experience. Just, just come on and talk about what I do or it doesn't have to be about voice acting. So would I recommend your show? Yes, absolutely. And how do you feel now? I feel like I've made a new friend. I feel like I've had a great time talking with you. And uh, I thank you very much for having me on the show. No, absolutely. The one thing I do want to point out, if you're available December 16th, or anyone who wants to join, December 16th at 8 p.m., 5 Western, what not, well, I say you you're from the West. Well, I did I get <laughs> Because in the, uh, the, the Western River, <laughs> Uh, the Western's like, what the hell is he talking? Are you talking about people in the past? <laughs> so December 16th at 8 p.m. Eastern. And if you're on the West Coast, it will be 5 o'clock. will be the Christmas episode, holiday episode of the Key Fans Network. And I would like to invite you to be a guest on it. Awesome. Um, well, we'll have to check the schedule and see if that works out. I hope it does. Um, but yeah, we'll talk. We'll talk. Yeah, absolutely. See if we can get that up. I do have a couple questions for you off the air for wrapping up our interview segment. It was an honor and privilege having you as a guest. And for our viewers who are watching, leave a comment for both of us. We will interact with that. But it was a real honor and privilege. And until we meet again, catch you later. Thank you and have a good night and happy holidays.